Hello everyone, Steve Edelman here, and my longtime good friend and colleague, Nalima Chu. We're both endocrinologists, and I helped, uh, I used to say, train mm -hmm. Nalima uh, to become one of the best endocrinologists in San Diego. Tell us about yourself, Nalima. Absolutely. I'm Nalima Chu. I'm an endocrinologist at Sharpe Staley Medical Group in San Diego. Uh, Dr. Edelman and I go back 24 years where he was my fellowship director and I, I can honestly say he's taught me everything I know about diabetes and so this is very um, exciting for me to be here with him to have this session. Yeah, and Nalima has spoken for us many times when we used to do face-to-face -face conferences. So let's jump into this session. It's basically called Know Your Numbers and you'll hit the jackpot with your diabetes health. Now, there's probably no better place to know your numbers than when you're at the crap table, when you're at the roulette wheel, when you're playing blackjack, and it's the same with our diabetes. And to be honest with you all, this is really important stuff. Everyone not only needs to know their numbers, what they mean, but they should also keep track of them over time. And it's up to you to keep track of them and to know what your individual goal is. Absolutely. When you know your numbers, it makes for a better appointment when you see your doctor too, because you can really sit down with them and go over these numbers and what they mean. And then it becomes individualized to you and what you need instead of, uh, you know, just randomly talking about things that are not important. Yeah, we'll probably mention this several times about individualization and uh, knowing your numbers is key. You'll, you, like you said, it creates mm -hmm. a good conversation. And the more you know, the better your, your caregiver will be, your doctor will be very happy with you. Absolutely. Unless you challenge him too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nalima, we have our special slot machine. Why don't you pull first? Let's do it. Okay, big money, big go, money. Go, go, <laughs> Give go. Give me a good number, good number. Yes. Woo! All right, yeah. Nalima, it says 7% equals 155. What are we talking about? Okay, this has got to be only one thing we could be talking about. That's A1C. This is a significantly important number. Um, this is when you go in for your blood test and they want to take a look and see how your diabetes is doing and how your control is. And this is the target range we want to reach for, is A1C of less than seven would be ideal. And that usually is reflective of glucose levels of 155 over the last 90 days. and Going up from there, 7.5 is equivalent to about 170, 8% is 185, 8.5 is 200, and so on. You taught me a really in, um, cool trick which I use with my patients, which is if you start with the A1C of 7 being 155, for every 1% you increase, it's about 30 points more. So you can kind of play these games and say, let me guess what your blood sugars are going to be and what your A1C is, and you'll hit it pretty darn close. And they think but you're really smart. Really smart. It so sets us up to win in Vegas. There you go. Um, you know, I think for some of you, it's important to mention the 10%. You know, it's an average blood sugar of 260 over the past two to three months. But yeah. once again, I think both you and I would agree that most folks need to be less than 8%. Absolutely. Depending on your age, uh, other medical conditions, hypoglycemia unawareness. But my own personal goal for my patients is try to get them down to 7.5. Yeah. But it takes time and not everybody can do it. Right. And it's safety first. You know, you mentioned this earlier that we really need to individualize this because everybody is different. There's no one set answer here. If you um, have a lot of other conditions like heart disease or you were having a lot of low blood sugars where you can't feel it anymore, we may run you a little bit higher so you can recognize hypoglycemia when it happens. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Now, the other thing too is all of you probably don't know, but the, the lab that measures the A1C in your mm -hmm. blood, it, it, that number could be off. Absolutely. What I'm trying to say is I had a patient just yesterday that said, oh my God, my A1C is going up from 5.9 to 6.0. You know, it's not that specific. It's a generalized number and it can be affected uh, by certain medical conditions. I think mm -hmm. the classic one is anemia. Right. Because the A1C is measured from the blood. 
Absolutely. And medications too, Steve. You know, if somebody is getting uh, epigen to increase their red blood cell count, that can uh, artificially give you a different A1C. So there are many different conditions as well, which we call hemoglobinopathies, where it doesn't give us an accurate measurement. So there are other ways we can get that same number. That's a big um, word. <laughs> big word, I know. <laughs> and uh, so it's important to keep all of those in mind. It's a wonderful reference number that we look at, but that's not the whole answer. We are ready for the next roulette. It's not a roulette. Jack, blackjack. Here we go. I'll, t I'll do it this time. Go for it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Let's go. We need some go. good numbers go. again. Go. All right. What do we get? So I'm seeing 120 slash 80. Steve, what does that mean? Well, it's obviously, to me, as a doctor, a blood pressure measurement. But I think there's a lot more that goes into this, uh, this machine because 120 over 80 represents uh, almost two types of blood pressure. Mm -hmm. One when your heart is pumping, the other one when your heart's relaxing. Yep. And we have goals for the, the systolic, which is the top number, and the mm -hmm. diastolic, which is the low number. This right. is this can be confusing. What do you have to? What what are some of the normal levels, and what's your panic level? So of course, I you know, blood pressure can change depending on the circumstance. One of the first things my patients will tell me is, "Your parking lot was so crazy. <laughs> I got into an accident in your parking lot. Please don't look at my blood pressure and think that's how I normally run." I'd ask if it was my car right. that they it, hit. <laughs> So it's, that's what it is. You have to keep this in a perspective of other things that are going on. If someone's in pain, their blood pressure can be higher. If they're anxious, the blood pressure can be higher. So it is important to get the values a couple of times before we confirm whether they have high blood pressure or not. I don't like to see over 140, over 90 in my diabetics. That's definitely uh, action time. Um, so we like to keep the blood pressure less than uh, 130 over uh, 80, if yeah. possible, 130 over 85. But again, individualized. The yeah. goal is not to get them to pass out with lowering the blood pressure. Yeah, so. it's not good if your blood pressure gets too low. Yes. But uh, blood pressure affects not only your heart, but also your eyes, your Absolutely. kidneys, and many other organs. So it's extremely important. The one thing that, that drives me crazy is that um, I measure my own blood pressure. It could change mm -hmm. in three minutes. Oh, yeah. So it's like, it's like airline tickets, it's the rent a car that yeah. you rent, and it changes so much. And it's important to write them down and multiple, multiple numbers. Now, Absolutely. We, we should talk about measuring your own at home. Yes. So they have the wrist Yep. and they have the, the cuff around yep. the arm. And um, I find that people are not instructed how to do it right. correctly. Right. And you need to get a cuff that's big enough for an arm. Mm -hmm. Biceps like these, you need a large cuff, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you need to be sitting, and it has to it has to be at the level of your heart. Absolutely, and the cup has to be on right, and um, take a take a couple deep breaths, yeah. and not too many exciting things going on, and uh, like level you of the heart, the level of the heart. What, what do you think of the wrist ones? You think they're accurate? You know. Some of the ones that are out there are fine and they're accurate. What I also tell my patients is bring your cuff in when you come to an appointment because let's take a look what we are getting in the office compared to what you're getting because sometimes I see a discrepancy there and you know clearly ours are calibrated in the office so we do trust them. So we can compare the two for you and let you know how accurate yours is. That's a, that's a really good point. And the other thing too is 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 Sometimes the nurse or the medical assistant checking you in yeah. will check your blood pressure. She might be in a hurry. Absolutely. And if it's, you know, they pump up your arm, right? And then as they lower the pressure, if they do it too fast, you miss important beats right. that they would hear in their, in their stethoscope. And uh, you basically get an artificial reading. Right. So, so many nuances with blood pressure. Yeah. So checking it at home is definitely encouraged, and I think it's a good thing to have. And then writing down those numbers and bringing them with you to the appointment so your provider can see them is also good. Whenever I go, go to see my uh, doctor, it's always high. You know, his his ex-wife is the person checking me in, asking me for the copay, <laughs> and then the nurse is rushing me in the room, and I'm trying to relax, and she's talking to me while they're right. doing the blood pressure. Don't talk. Right. And then also, you know, she'll say, lift up your arm. And that's that's using your muscles. And don't cross your legs. I always cross my legs. Should we move on? Yes. To the next okay. number? Your turn. Okay, my turn. Let's go. 
Mm. Hey, we're doing mm. great. Go. Got to keep this going. We're going we're we're to buy a this. Porsche after this. Is <laughs> All right. Well, these numbers might, this might be tougher. Okay. 100, 45, 200. Okay. I hope that's not my weight. But anyway, <laughs> the, I, you know, this is kind of looking like cholesterol to me. I'm going to say that the 100 is for the LDL cholesterol. LDL, the way I think about it, is L for lousy. That's the bad cholesterol. And we want that to be less than 100 in those that don't have any history of heart attacks or other strokes or other cardiovascular problems. We definitely want to lower than that less than 70 if you do. So that's a really important number. And um, the other number, HDL, is the 45. And that's different for men and women. Depends on if a woman is in menopause or not. If for men, we want that to be more than 45, and women more than 55 if they're premenopausal. But after menopause, they drop down to the man's goal, which is greater than 45. So that's because they're losing estrogen. Absolutely, right? and estrogen is protective for the heart up until that age. So, yeah. Is that why women live longer than men? Oh, there are many reasons why <laughs> we live longer. <laughs> well, um, you know what, Nalima? Um, this whole LDL issue, mm. um, it's, it's so important. It's Absolutely. probably the, the strongest correlation with having a heart attack or stroke. And they've done lots right. of studies specifically in people with diabetes. And it's, you get more benefit lowering your LDL at preventing heart disease if you have diabetes than if you don't have diabetes. Absolutely. And um, we're not going to really get into all the different medications, mm -hmm. but one thing that has been has expanded, you know, we have the statin drugs. I know many of you said it causes muscle aches. You didn't even take your first pill yet. <laughs> uh, it's probably one of the most significant drugs we have to prevent we do. heart disease. Uh, then there's Zetia, there's PCSK9 inhibitors, mm -hmm. there's Nexlatol. So it's not the point of this program to go through each one of those, mm -hmm. but it's important for you to know if you don't get along with one of those drugs, you have to try, try to reach your goal. something else, absolutely. So much so that, you know, the ADA says that if you're above 40, doesn't matter how good your LDL is, you still need to be on a statin for the cardioprotective benefits. Yep. Can't ignore that. And like, you know, like you said, it's, uh, you know, one medication works for some, it may not work for others. And so it's important to have that conversation, be open to it. One thing you've always taught me several years ago is when people are resistant to trying insulin, you say, you know, try it, just try it for one week. It's the one week challenge, one month challenge. It was the one month challenge, yeah. One month challenge. And you'll see what a difference it can make. And then, you know, you're not going to be so opposed to it. Statins are the same way. And it's not all or none. If you, don't, if you can't take it every day, maybe three times a week is better than nothing. Yeah. And I think it's important to say that um, it's when you look at your cholesterol levels, you know, especially the LDL and the HDL, they kind of go together. Yeah. So, for example, I saw a patient yesterday, I had clinic yesterday, and her, her LDL was 116, mm -hmm. and she did not want to go on a statin, which is typically the first drug of choice, mm -hmm. which is a good idea. And her LDL, her HDL was 65. Okay. So, you know, her her protective cholesterol- The ratio. Yeah, was high, mm -hmm. and she said she wanted to try diet. Now, most of the time, uh, diet can only lower your LDL just a little bit, even okay. if you're eating perfectly. Right. But because her HDL was, was protective, I said, okay, let's do it next time in three That's months. Mm -hmm. And if it's not below 100, then we would start a medication. Because um, I would say there's one area where I'm more prone to using a medication. That's to get your cholesterol. Because the number one cause of passing away for both mm -hmm. type 2 and type 1 uh, people with diabetes is heart disease. And, you know, cardiologists and also endocrinologists are using a coronary calcium score to mm -hmm. decide if you're on the fence where someone would benefit from a statin or not. That's a good point. To help them decide one way or another to use it. But, you know, you mentioned diet and triglycerides is the other number that I was hoping that wasn't my weight when I looked at those was a 200. And, and that comes from diet. You know, there are genetic causes of elevated triglycerides, but that is the source from dietary fried foods, fatty foods, butter, milk, cheese, all the good stuff, you know, in the red meats and the bacon, that can raise your triglycerides. And <laughs> yeah. we want that to be less than 200. Less than 150 would be better, but getting it less than 200. I was 200 thinking of helps. my favorite Indian dish that's, uh, it's got the 
the white blocks of cheese. Oh, paneer. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that'll, you know, that'll raise you It's whole high. milk and then you fry it too. <laughs> Talk about getting your triglycerides you know, high. I don't care what culture you're in. You're, you're, you're going to be eating food that may not be the best for you. But um, I think making the conscious effort yes. with, with diet um, and exercise. Absolutely. Now, ex speaking of exercise, uh, that is supposedly can raise your HDL a little bit. That's right. And so can alcohol. Yes. I drink two or three drinks before 10 a.m. just because I want to get my HDL up. Well, what do you, what do you have to say that? You, you, I have you, a joke for you. Okay. That's why I run from bar to bar to bar. <laughs> <laughs> you better stick to your day job. <laughs> um, well, what, what kind of things uh, can people do to raise their HDL? Because we really do not have medications other than... Uh, if you lower your triglycerides, your HDL kind of <clears throat> conversely goes up a little bit. But other than that, there's no drug that says, okay, you take this drug, it's approved to raise your HDL. Right. There's niacin um, that can raise HDL, but it can also affect glucose levels. And there is the flushing that happens with it too. So it's not one of my favorite medications, but people do say, oh, you know, I can get benefit. But exercise is the best way. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing too that you should know that uh, your cholesterol levels and even your HDL is hereditary. Yes. So um, we know that when people live into their hundreds, their HDL is pretty, is usually pretty high. Yeah. And <clears throat> when you have a low HDL, you're stuck with it, kind of. Well, Nalima, the slot machine had that number on the right that said 200, <clears throat> referring to triglycerides. And yep. I think particularly important for people with type 2 diabetes, they do have higher triglycerides yep. than people with type 1 or the non-diabetic population. Mm -hmm. So at what level do you start to worry uh, about the level being too high? Yeah, th that's a really good question because metabolic syndrome, which is what we see with type 2 diabetes, has that exact parameters you were talking about, high triglycerides, low HDL. So with triglycerides, dietary changes are very important. You know, talking about eating more plant-based foods helps with the triglycerides, but there are medications that help too. Because like you mentioned, sometimes it doesn't come down. There's a familial component, genetic component. There is. So using statins can help, but there are medications targeting specifically the triglycerides, and they're called fibrates. And we can also use Zetia, fish oil. So the options are endless. Yeah, and uh, I think, would, would you agree that triglycerides bounce around like crazy as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. If I ate pizza yesterday and had my uh, triglycerides checked, they would be higher today. Well, yeah, and th glad you mentioned that because when they tell you you have to fast mm -hmm. to get your lipid panel done, you have to fast because of the triglycerides. Uh, yep. You, you can get your LDL measured any old time, and but they use that number and a formula, and they actually calculate your LDL, and that's really high. Now, if any of you ever had a condition called pancreatitis, mm -hmm. when your pancreas gets all inflamed, it's usually when the triglycerides are above 500. Yeah, I've seen it with 2,000, 3,000, and those are usually familial causes of um, um, elevated triglycerides, but alcohol can also raise triglycerides. Yeah, well, that's when, that's when you ate the, the whole pizza. <laughs> <laughs> now, just to finish up, um, you'll... All of you will see, you know, your LDL, your HDL, your triglycerides, but you'll also see the total cholesterol. Yeah. And I've, I, you remember me teaching that when yes. you were younger, that the total cholesterol could be very misleading. And the, the, the head of the lab will say, oh, you have an abnormal <clears throat> col total cholesterol because it's above 200. Right. But remember that your LDL and your HDL, in a way, go into the total. Absolutely. So if, if you're like a super athlete, your HDL may be really high, which is awesome. It'll raise your total. Mm -hmm. Now you know more than your doctor does. And the calculation for that, and you taught me this, is total cholesterol is LDL plus HDL plus triglycerides divided by five. Wow. How do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think it's your turn to pull. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Hey. We're getting near the end. <clears throat> yes, we are. Okay. This is good. Big money. Big money. Okay. Well, I see 70 and 180. What is that all about? Let me think. These are getting tougher as we uh, they get are, to the aren't end. They? Um, the 180 is definitely my IQ. I'm not sure what the 70 is. No. <laughs> well, being someone with type 1 diabetes and using a continuous glucose monitor, Ooh, yeah. that, that sounds like time and range, which mm -hmm. is the percent of time that an individual is between 70 and 180. Now, this, this is an important uh, 
topic for, for this session because it's for people with type 2. Yes. And continuous glucose monitors are being used more and more. Absolutely. Dexcom, the Libre, yep. the Eversense. <clears throat> and how do you use time and range in your practice? I love this. You know, before we had all these continuous glucose monitoring, I had a crystal ball. <laughs> and I would look through it and be like, ah, oh, what is your time and range? And in fact, that's something that we weren't even taught in fellowship. Oh, nope. We put everything on that A1C, but you and I know A1C is so um, it, it, deceiving because, you know, if you have a super high, average it with a super low, you're going to get a beautiful A1C and that doesn't tell you anything. So mm -hmm. we have the option in our office to download all of these devices. So Dexcom with the cloud, we share with the clinic, Freestyle Libre, the same thing. So I log into the cloud, I bring up the screen and I will show the patients. Because part of it is, you know, and this is another thing that I, you've really taught us is that you got to educate the patients. And this is what this is all about. Right. right? That's what we're doing right now. The more they understand, the more they can see how their behavior affects the blood sugars. And they need to make that connection because then it helps you realize what they should or should not be doing. Yeah. And just to add on to that, um, besides giving you uh, an idea of what your blood sugars have been over the past two to three months, you know, the A1C doesn't tell you how much you're bouncing around. Right. And it doesn't tell you how many, what percent of time you're below range. Absolutely. And that's the other part of uh, this, what we call this continuous glucose monitoring metrics. Yeah. So we have time in range, but also very importantly, probably the, the next thing we look at, or even first sometime, is the time below range. No one likes to have hypoglycemia. Right. And there's two levels typically, less than 70, and then very low, less than 55. Yep. And we we allow for um, 4% or less. Now, mm -hmm. the 4%, every percent represents 15 minutes. Oh. So 4% means that uh, during the length that you've been wearing your CGM, that you are below 70 an hour a day. Yeah. So that wow. sounds like a lot. Yeah. And some days more than others, but it averages out. You know, it takes years for complications to come from high blood sugars. You know, the retinopathy we talk about, the neuropathy, um, the, you know, the kidney issues, heart disease. But one fatal hypoglycemic episode can change your life today. Whether it be, you, you know, you lose your driver's license or there's a seizure that happens or, you know, someone can get into a car accident and kill someone. <clears throat> Which happens. Well, you know, unfortunately, it does happen. And so I really worry and I look at the time below range, um, just like you mentioned, because, you know, every time a hypoglycemic episode happens, you're killing off brain cells. Yeah. And it's also important to realize these are the standard recommendations. Right. If you're <clears throat> elderly um, and you're you want to be very cautious about hypo. Absolutely. You know, time and range, if you're 50% or greater, mm -hmm. that's good. But right. we're always shooting for zero or less than 1% time below range. And, you know, we, they, we've seen studies, Accord and various studies that have shown that intensive therapy does have some risks, especially if you're elderly, it can cause arrhythmias of the heart and have cardiac issues. So I worry about the low blood sugars for many, many reasons. And yeah. Uh, I would rather see a fantastic time and range than focus on an A1C of like 5.9 or 5.7. If I'm seeing a hot, lots of lows with the 5.7, I am not a happy person. Yeah, and I think so, it's good that you, you all hear this because some of you think the lower the A1C, the better, yeah. but it puts you at risk. Absolutely. Now, the other thing that people with diabetes that, that use these continuous glucose monitors, you know, you can see the number and it gives you a trend arrow. Mm -hmm. And if you're on insulin, it tells you what direction you're going yes. and has tremendous, it should have tremendous influence on giving yourself a little more than usual or when the arrow's going down a little less than usual. So um, as you mentioned earlier, Nalima, you know, the person using this device, the person mm -hmm. with diabetes really needs to be knowledgeable about what these numbers mean, absolutely, how to respond to the trend arrows. And, um, you know, all of these CGMs have software where you can look at your own data. Yeah. It's the same language that you use with, with that caregivers use. Right. So you should be familiar with time and range, time below range, um, you know, and things like that.
Yeah, it's wonderful that you don't have to check your blood sugars, but that's not the only reason why we use this. There's so much information that's in there. So I think knowing these numbers and what they mean goes a long way with not only for your health and improvement, but also your relationship with your provider, because then literally you're on the same page. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, last one. Here we go. Let's do <clears throat> this. Okay. Go, 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 go. Pew, pew, let's go, okay. That's tough because it just says 50 and it says 36. That's clearly our ages. You're less than 50 and I'm less than 36. <laughs> yeah, 67 is the new 50. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, since we were just talking about time and range, I have a feeling we're talking about standard deviation and the coefficient variant. So, well, that's those are two numbers that are on the CGM metrics download. That's right. So, how would you describe uh, what they mean to people? That because they're fancy math terms. Yeah. So for me, standard deviation, the way I would describe it is the difference between the highs and the lows. So, you know, we don't want to see these big wide dips, um, you know, because again, that gives us a beautiful A1C, but that's not good. That's not healthy. You know, we can see numbers that go way down. And then if you're going way high and you're doing this yo-yo thing all day, definitely that's time for intervention for us to figure out where this high is happening and how we're going to fix it and where the lows are happening and why that's happened. Yeah, that's a great point because you could have a fairly good average. Yeah. But if you're bouncing around, if you're on a roller coaster, as we say, you know, that's not only could be dangerous because we're on the low side, you could be really low, but it's frustrating for all of you living with diabetes, right. bouncing up and, and going down. And every time you have a discussion with your caregiver, you, you should be both looking at this 24-hour profile that yeah. you get with these downloads. And I love this because it kind of gives me patterns. This has trained me to look at these graphs and look and see what pattern am I getting out of it. So, you know, I don't worry about one isolated number right? Because that can be one point in time. We don't know if it's on its way up or we don't know if it's on its way down. But if I'm seeing patterns day after day laying on top of each other and shows exactly at six o'clock in the evening, they're all going up, then I can go, what are you doing at six o'clock? And then we can have intervention. Yeah. And even if your average blood sugar over the length of your time that you're wearing your CGM is a little bit high, if your standard deviation or coefficient of variability is low, meaning you're very consistent, that's the easiest thing to fix. But Absolutely. When, when you're all over the place, it's just hard to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we hit the jackpot. And, uh, <laughs> and that was fun. It was great. All right, everybody. Take care. Know your numbers. <laughs>